This is my friend Jacob Applebaum. He lives in Seattle, and he was supposed to be speaking here this afternoon. Uh, he wasn't able to make it. He's been having some trouble traveling lately. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, and he works on a number of things that are related to openness and privacy in some way. Uh, one of them is a project called WikiLeaks, which has something to do with some of the troubles he's had with traveling. Uh, another one is a project called Tor. Uh, and both of these have something to do with openness and something to do with privacy. Uh, Tor is an anonymity network. It's an open source project. And it was actually sponsored by my organization, EFF, at one time. It's now an independent organization. Uh, they make software that routes your communications through a lot of intermediaries. And you can achieve anonymity, hopefully, subject to some assumptions, subject to some limitations. Uh, and it routes your communications through three intermediaries, and then they end up where they were headed. Uh, some of you may have used this one time or another. One of the really notable things about Tor is the openness of the design. So the Tor people have published papers and articles about exactly how Tor is meant to work, about what their assumptions are, um, and all the details of the design. And they've encouraged people to take a look at that, to attack it, to criticize it, to review it. So this is Roger Dingledine, one of the inventors of Tor. This photo was actually taken by Quinn, who spoke earlier today. Um, Roger is a really amazing person, uh, not only because he's a brilliant computer scientist and a brilliant programmer, but if some of you have heard programmers and system implementers talk about their work, um, and then you hear Roger talk about his work, it's really different. Roger is really humble, and he really likes criticism. And he really likes to admit the limitations of his work. And he really likes to admit the problems with his work. And if someone comes to him and says, you know, I don't think that Tor is able to protect people in this scenario, he'll say, ah, oh, you're absolutely right. We can't protect people in that scenario. Uh, can you help us let people know about that? He doesn't say, oh, my software is perfect. My software solves everyone's privacy problems forever. My software is the best in the world. None of this. So he has this kind of admirable detachment and he's really cultivated this, I think. And he encourages criticism. He encourages review. He encourages attacks. And when people come up with new attacks on Tor, he really rejoices. Because for him, it's really an advancement of human knowledge. Now we know something more that people ought to know about the limitations of the tools that they're using. Um, there's this apocryphal quote attributed to Edison about he now knows a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. And I think that's often Roger's attitude toward anonymity research. Well, now we know a thousand ways that we can't achieve anonymity on the internet. Uh, and it's great that we do. Uh, so this is August Kirchhoffs. He was a Dutchman who lived, um, that's uh, two centuries ago now, I guess. Uh, he was a mathematician and a cryptographer. And he was one of the first people to introduce in the academic realm, in the security discussion, the idea that we shouldn't rely on security through obscurity. Uh, in particular, he said, you should assume when you're designing a cryptographic system, a security system, that your adversary, that your opponent actually knows the details of how it works. And you shouldn't rely on the idea that they don't know how the system works. Uh, and he had a lot of arguments about why this is so. He said, you can have a secret key. You can have some secret that's used to encrypt things. But you shouldn't rely on a secret design. And I think history has really borne out his observation very well. People sometimes call it Kirchhoff's principle, Kirchhoff's criterion. Um, they say the principle that you shouldn't rely on security through obscurity. Uh, there are a lot of systems designers who are really overconfident about their own work. So they come up with something, and they can't break it. They can't find a way around it. So they say, oh, well, this is great. You know, No one could find a way around this. And obviously, it's a big leap from I invented this thing, and I don't know how to break it, to no one can break it. Uh, people sometimes underestimate how big a leap that is. So in the modern world, humanity has benefited quite a lot from peer review. It's really a way that um, people advance. Um, I met a computer scientist, um, Professor Rudick from Carnegie Mellon, who practices sleight of hand magic. And he went to India. And he said they have these great folk traditions of magic tricks. And they're really wonderful, and there's a lot of history. But somehow it hasn't advanced as fast as the American magicians. And he said, I think it's actually peer review, because the American magicians actually discovered this peer review process and started having conferences and journals. 
And all of a sudden, even though they didn't have the same tradition, they, made, they covered a lot of ground in a short time. Um, but we have a lot of contexts in which we've seen the benefits of peer review. Uh, I think it's really a powerful thing. And there are a lot of security systems that have actually been broken that were originally security through obscurity. They were kept secret. When the details were disclosed, in very short order, someone said, no, 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 that doesn't work. Um, the security system for privacy of our cell phones, A51, uh, came out of the industry. They didn't subject it to peer review. In 1998, someone figured out the details of how it worked. And in very short order, people said, this is no good. Um, and I don't know if all of you have been following this, but there are actually cell phone tapping boxes that can tap phone calls over the air. And one of the reasons for that, uh, and without the cooperation of the cell phone company, you just put the box down somewhere and it records people's phone calls. One of the reasons for that is that the industry didn't subject their security system to peer review. When the details came out, it was broken very quickly. Uh, there are lots of other examples of that. Uh, in a sense, the, the German enigma from World War II is also in that category. They thought no one would know how it worked. Um, the British were able to capture some. The Polish were able to capture some. When they captured them, they realized ways to attack them that the designers hadn't anticipated. Um, so the security through obscurity is a real issue. And we'd like to think that openness itself is going to give us all these benefits. We'd like to think that just by having things that are open, they're going to be safer. They're going to protect people better. They're going to be more reliable. Um, so Eric Raymond is a programmer who wrote a program to download email. And it was open source. And he was really impressed because people started fixing bugs for him. And they started getting in touch with him and saying, oh, you know, I found this bug in your software. Here's your fix. And he was grateful. And he noticed that this was happening on a larger scale with Linux. And so Raymond described this thing that he called Linus's law to try to explain what was going on. And he said, um, Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. If enough people look at the system, they'll just be able to figure out what's wrong, and they'll just fix it. So this sounds really good, and it certainly has elements of truth. Uh, but there are lots of limitations to it. I'm sorry? People often feel like openness is this kind of magic dust. And if you have something open, you know everyone will just look at it. And it will be great, and we'll be safer. But there's a real social element that's necessary. You need to have people actually come look at it. You need communities of practice that are actually qualified to do the review. And so this is kind of this problem. You know, um, as a privacy organization, we get a lot of cranks writing to us about things. And we get people sending us their systems. And one of the problems is that they're often really isolated from the communities of practice where people could actually learn the skills that they need to review things and to understand if things work. So you need the social systems that support the review. You don't just need the openness. Um, there's a particular example that's kind of depressing. Um, maybe some of you have seen this. Uh, in 2006, there was a programmer in the Debian project um, this is some code from OpenSSL, pretty important cryptographic software, kind of a back end for a lot of other privacy tools. So the programmer thought that these two lines of code didn't do anything because he thought they were just incorporating some data that was just blank into your random number pool. So he took them out. Um, this was really bad, actually. This was actually the source of just about all the randomness in the system. And when he took them out, the number of possible keys went down from what it should have been, uh, which is a huge number, down to 32,768 possible keys, which is a pretty small number for a computer. Um, it's actually one of the worst security bugs in history, and we're still suffering some of the consequences of it. The point in terms of the many eyeballs is that even though this was open source code that was published on the internet, nobody noticed for two years. And so the openness was not magic dust that made the security problems go away. It seems that there was nobody who understood what this code was supposed to be doing who actually came along and noticed this problem. Um, and EFF is running a thing called the SSL Observatory. And we're trying to look at all the encrypted websites in the world and uh, check out some things about them. We're still running into weak, guessable keys that were generated as a result of this bug. Uh, in fact, thousands of them. So the consequences are still very severe. And this languished for years without being discovered, without being fixed.
uh, so this is my friend Benjamin Mako Hill. He lives over in Somerville, uh, does a lot of interesting stuff related to openness. He often tries to articulate why openness is important and what it actually can do for us, what it actually can offer to us. Um, he has a really interesting talk about a concept he articulated called anti-features. And so anti-features are features in a technology product, in a manufactured product, in an engineered and designed system that the end users actually don't like, that the end users would actually take out if they could, um, but that was put there deliberately by the designer of the system. So it's not a bug, it's an anti-feature. And so Mako has been collecting many, many examples of anti-features in real-world systems, things that the designers of systems put in that the users hate and that the users would like to remove. Um, and obviously there's a big connection to openness in terms of people's ability to understand these things, people's ability to describe them and be aware of them, and people's ability potentially to remove them. Now the most famous anti-features are digital rights management, restrictions on people's ability to use media and code in particular ways that they want to. Another really large class of anti-features that doesn't always receive as much attention is spyware, systems that send personal information to someone else, and backdoors. And you might think, well, spyware is really annoying, but it's kind of innocuous. It's that stuff that shows me all those ads all the time that I really hate, but it's not that bad. Well, it can get pretty serious. Um, the people at Citizen Lab who research internet censorship found this interesting thing a few years ago in the official Chinese version of Skype. So uh, people in China were being directed to the official Chinese Skype, which was called Tom Skype, and it had this content filter program which would censor the words that you could use in your chats. But the Citizen Lab people found out that not only did it censor your instant messages, it actually sent a copy of them to a server in China if you triggered the filter. Um, the way they found this was that they happened upon the server and it was misconfigured and they actually found the log of everyone's chats. So it was a pretty major discovery. Um, but so a spyware or a backdoor can actually be a really serious matter. We have some recent examples involving BlackBerry uh, about two years ago, the largest communications carrier in the United Arab Emirates, uh, Eti Salat, sent an over-the-air software update to people's Blackberries. You know, you have a new software version, would you like to download it? Well, this software update didn't actually make people's Blackberries better, it introduced an anti-feature in the form of some spyware that would send a blind carbon copy of every email message that you wrote on your Blackberry to a certain email address that was apparently controlled by the carrier. Uh, so that's kind of bad news. Also an anti-feature. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the controversies involving Etisalat haven't ended there. Uh, this is their tower in Dubai. They're actually based in Abu Dhabi, but people think this building is more interesting. Uh, it's a cool building. So there's been actually a more recent controversy involving the UAE government and this carrier, and BlackBerry, in fact. Uh, just a few years after trying to get people to install spyware on their Blackberries, um, the government has uh, issued a decree that Blackberry services will be blocked in their country. And the reason is that they say that the Blackberry services are too secure and too private. Um, so I don't know how many of you remember this guy, uh, Louis Free, who was the director of the FBI for many years and it was kind of a formative time for me, there was this period that we often call the crypto wars, where the US government said, um, and uh, Director Free was really one of the main proponents of this idea, that we don't want civilians to have access to strong cryptography and strong privacy tools because they're too secure and they'll protect people too well against the government. And this was really a major political issue and the government really tried to prevent us from having these strong privacy tools. But it's almost a distant memory here in the US now. Um, even though for some computer security people it was a very formative time, now it just seems natural that we can use encryption, we can use tools like Tor, we can try to protect our communications. Uh, but in fact, in many places around the world, this political consensus has never been 
attained in the same way. This political consensus doesn't exist in the same way. And so a number of other countries, soon after the announcement in the um, UAE, made similar announcements that they wanted to block particular services because they were too secure and too private. Uh, and they cited BlackBerry as an example. And in fact, people said, BlackBerry is not the only thing. And that started giving other regimes ideas about other things that they might want to block. Uh, so I think there's a reprise of the crypto wars brewing uh, around the world. And there's a real fight politically and technologically about people's access to tools that protect them and protect their privacy. And I think openness is going to play a really key role in this fight in terms of allowing people to find out what the tools they use actually do and whether there are backdoors, whether there could be backdoors that could be sending their communications off somewhere they would rather their communications not be sent. Uh, I think that's about it. Thank you very much.